it was a different age and a different generation. After six exhausting years of bombings and privation, Londoners in the 1940s took great pride in themselves. They were courteous and disciplined. Bomb sites were cleared, the bricks neatly piled to one side, and little makeshift gardens created. Perhaps the most impressive sight I came upon was when I emerged from the tube station at Piccadilly Circus. I found a little table with a pile of newspapers and a box of coins and notes with nobody in attendance to take your newspaper, toss your coin into the box or put your ten shilling note and take your change. I took a deep breath. This was truly a civilized people. After three months in London, I abandoned life in a bedsitter for the University town of Cambridge, where survival skills were not so necessary. <laughs> because the university, which catered for 10,000 gentlemen and a few young ladies, assumed that they did not have such menial skills and so were prepared to administer to their needs. That Britons today are better off materially than they were is visible everywhere. But that quiet pride and self-confidence, that national cohesiveness that marked out the British people after victory in World War II, that has dissipated. Many of my British contemporaries believe that the loss of empire caused, caused that loss of Elan. The mirage of a Commonwealth unity beguiled the British people from facing up to the hard reality that Britain was no longer the heart of empire. Looking back at those early years, I am amazed at my youthful innocence. I watched Britain at the beginning of a great experiment with a welfare state. The Adley government started to build a society that attempted to look after its citizens from cradle to grave. I was so impressed after the introduction of the National Health Service. When I went to collect my new pair of glasses from my opticians in Cambridge, I was told that there was no payment. None was due. All I had to do was to sign a form. What a civilized society, I thought to myself. The same thing happened with the dentist and the doctor. I did not understand what a cosseted life would do to the spirit of enterprise of a people, diminishing their desire to achieve, to excel, and to succeed. I believed then that wealth came naturally from wheat growing in the fields, orchards bearing fruit every summer, and factories turning out all that was needed to maintain a comfortable life. Only two decades later, when I had to make an outdated entrepreneur economy free the people, did I realize that people needed to create the wealth before we could share it. And to create wealth, high motivation, incentives are crucial to drive a people to achieve, to take risks for profits or there would be nothing to share. I think it is remarkable that powerful minds like beverages, who sought out this egalitarian welfare system, did not foresee the unintended consequences. It took more than three decades of gradual decline before Margaret Thatcher set out to reverse it, to restore individual incentives and the motivation to succeed to encourage risk-taking necessary for a successful entrepreneurial economy. In the five decades since I first came to London, so much has changed. I remember enough of the past to regret the passing of that age when power and influence made London throb and hum 
and count for much more in the affairs of the world. Five decades ago, London was a grimy, sooty, bomb-scarred city with less food, less cars, and deprived of the conveniences of the consumer society. But the people were homogeneous, white, Christians, admirable, self-confident, courteous. From that well-mannered Britain to the yobs and football hooligans of the 1990s took only 40 years. I learned that civilized living does not come about naturally. There have been other significant changes. Britain is now multiracial, multilingual, multireligious. Churches are nearly empty on Sundays, with many deconsecrated and converted into places of entertainment, while some 500 mosques are filled to capacity on Fridays, the Muslim Sabbath. And so also are many Hindu temples and places of worship of other religions. Well, what of the future? I could not foresee my own country's fate. In January 1968, when the British government announced their withdrawal from the east of Suez, which included Singapore, I feared that the curtains would come down on us. I read with unease several scholarly analyses in British weeklies comparing it to the withdrawal of the Roman legions from Britain. It was a most ominous analogy. It conjured up visions of loss of civic order, of anarchy and barbarity in its place. Fortunately, the past has not been an accurate pointer to the future. Today, there are more Britons toing and froing between Britain and Singapore than ever since. And there are more British merchants, industrialists, bankers, professionals than ever in Singapore, making a great contribution to our economy. Technological breakthroughs have made historical analogies misleading. Many conf confidently predicted that the end of the Cold War would bring stability and growth and the peace dividend. Instead, the world is beset with new dangers, not least of them from fanatical Muslim terrorists. All the power and might of the United States might not be able to completely suppress a religiously driven terrorist. An America fearful of weapons of mass destruction in the hands of Saddam Hussein. Technology has brought different races with divergent religions and cultures into constant interaction and with sometimes unexpected and unhappy outcomes. However, breakthroughs in science and technology, especially in the life sciences, promise mankind longer, healthier and more fulfilling lives. And it is the young across the world who will be the major beneficiaries of these discoveries. But they will have to manage the problems that come with rapid changes in the way they live, work and interact with each other in an ever smaller world or there will be more strife and conflict. Thank you.